Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security, and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. We count on them to help when we call, but police departments say fewer people are up for the job. So when you have people that can find uh, easy employment, doing an easier job, and maybe making as much or more money, then uh, policing doesn't necessarily become as attractive for them. Ahead, how police are changing their recruiting strategies to ensure the force's future. Brandon Smith sits down with Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb to talk about the big stories in state government and what he hopes to tackle next year. Am I pleased that I think we're turning the ship around and, and heading in the right direction on a multiple on multiple fronts? Yes, I'm, I'm pleased that we're heading in the right direction. And we look back at 2018. From devastating tragedies to heartwarming victories, this year was a time of great tumult and sweeping change in Indiana. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Cities across the country are struggling to find the police officers to fill vacant positions. Some departments are rethinking how they lure in recruits. Reporter Barbara Brozier joins us now. Well, earlier this year, the Seattle Police Department put up a billboard in Indianapolis trying to convince officers to move across the country for a new job in the Pacific Northwest. Several Indiana departments are changing some of their policies or offering incentives to try and attract more recruits. They're doing it out of necessity to compete for a dwindling number of applicants. Bloomington is home to the state's largest university. Enrollment at IU approached 43,000 in the fall. The city welcomes about 2 million visitors a year. That's on top of the 85,000 people the U.S. Census Bureau estimates already live here. But one statistic that may surprise you, the size of the city's police department. Everybody is struggling with that. Bloomington's police department will have just more than 100 officers when it finishes its current hiring phase. That will give the department about 1.2 officers for every 1,000 people in the community. That's half the national average. Finding people to fill open positions is a constant challenge. We're looking for those really good quality candidates, but so is everyone else. Kellum says the shortage of candidates is the result of several factors, low unemployment in the state, low compensation, and changing perceptions of the profession. We have a lot of issues that are going on within the media and representations that we're seeing uh, across those media platforms about law enforcement, some of them fairly, some of them unfairly, and all of those shade that uh, people's opinions of law enforcement. Some members of Black Lives Matter Bloomington protested the department's purchase of an armored vehicle earlier this year, accusing the city of not being transparent about the process. BPD is doing what it can to combat those negative perceptions and make it easier for interested candidates to apply. That includes taking what was a 21-page application and condensing it into a shorter online form. We definitely are changing things to make it easier for millennials to start the process. But the recruiting problems aren't unique to Bloomington. Police departments across the country are facing the same challenges. Data from the Bureau of Justice Statistics shows the number of full-time sworn officers for every 1,000 people dropped 11 percent nationwide over a nearly 20-year period. That's leading some departments to make drastic changes to make the job more appealing. Just recently, our uh, 
city council and mayor approved a uh, pay increase for our officers so um, and that will result uh, for many of them to be you know several thousand dollars which would put us on par uh, with some of the higher paying departments um, across the state in addition to bumping pay columbus also expanded its take-home car policy and changed appearance guidelines. More than a quarter of the officers here are veterans, and tattoos are a military tradition. They were having to cover up all of their tattoos. You know, many of them have visible tattoos on their arms, and they would have to wear long sleeve shirts year round, which, uh, you know, July, August, that could be very uncomfortable on top of a, a ballistic vest. So, um, so they were really excited to hear that they'll be able to wear um, short sleeves any any time that they want. Harris says he's already received one email from an officer in Virginia who's interested in coming to the department because of the policy change. But some worry it's not enough to get the large number of people needed to fill jobs once older officers retire. Timothy Horty is the executive director of the Indiana Law Enforcement Academy, where most officers in the state go for training. He often hears about the shortage from departments, but says what he sees is encouraging. Our numbers aren't changing. In fact, ours are going up because uh, there is a large demand to get these young officers trained and out there in the streets serving their community. While there may be smaller pools of candidates for departments to choose from, he says the quality of recruits isn't going down. And Kellum says that's important for the public to know. As departments compete to fill jobs, the bar for potential officers remains high. It doesn't change who we're hiring and looking for. Our standards are staying the same. Data the FBI released last year shows the average salary for police and sheriff's patrol officers in Indiana is just over $53,000. Departments say when people can make that much or more in a job that's much less risky, it makes it hard to find officers. Barbara, thank you very much. Governor Eric Holcomb spent much of the year focused on issues at the Department of Child Services, including an independent investigation into the embattled agency. Brandon Smith talks with Holcomb about that work and what lies ahead in 2019. Uh, I want to start with something that's consumed a lot of attention really this whole year, which is uh, the Department of Child Services. Uh, we got the report from the uh, independent auditor uh, about halfway through the year. Your administration just sort of released the sort of progress report to us when we talked about your agenda a couple weeks ago. A lot of it seemed to be we're still studying, we're still developing. Um, are you comfortable with where you are in the process? Well, I'm never going to be comfortable uh, as long as there is an at-risk population out there. And there is, unfortunately, as, as there is around the country. But this is our state. And uh, I, am I pleased that I think we're turning the ship around and, and heading in the right direction on a multiple on multiple fronts yes i'm i'm pleased that we're heading in the right direction i'm pleased that we have this action step but as you saw some of these are in progress some of them won't be in progress until the legislature gives us a um, the tools necessary to to advance uh, there seemed to be the sense again when dcs submitted its budget request to kind of bring it up to where it's already spending that everybody said yeah okay Let's do that. But then we got a fairly eye-opening revenue forecast. Are you, do you feel like that's a number that might change? We're confident that uh, that's what's needed. And I think it's evidenced um, by past spending and, and where it's actually going. So again, I'm, I'm, I want to hear what their ideas are. And if they got a better idea than we have right now to draw that down, I'm all ears. And then very quickly to wrap up, uh, you're going into 2019 in a hate crimes debate um, now in which the people on the other side of this who say, no, we don't want this law, are some of the people, the same people, um, or at least led by some of the same people that you faced off with in a marriage plank debate um, last year uh, or earlier this year. Um, the, 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 Jim Bops, yeah, the Jim Bobs, the Michael Clarks of the world. Um, why are you confident that you'll win this fight when you didn't win that one? I need to do a better job. I'll take some responsibility for this. In the, in the past, I haven't weighed in heavily, uh, monitored it, were part of discussions um, when I thought it was going to be counterproductive, um, politely intervened. Uh, it, it is a different world today. And if we want to continue to attract talent, uh, quality of place and space and life, ultimately, 
uh, factor. It's one of those boxes. And matter of fact, it might be it might be as important as your tax in a regulatory environment to many. And so what I've noticed is an increase in that becoming part of the conversation. What I really worry about is all the conversations I never get to because they just fly over our state because they know we're on the one of five list, not the one of 45 list. And so it's, it also makes business sense. Thanks so much for sitting down with me. Thanks, Brandon, very much. You heard them talking about the tough budget position the state is in. One reason is that corporate tax revenue is expected to fall in the second year of the state's next budget. It's likely to grow just three-tenths of a percent. Now, some say ongoing tax cuts are to blame. Democratic lawmakers want to stop a number of corporate tax cuts, but Republican lawmakers say those breaks are vital for business in the state. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Vico County commissioners are close to purchasing an unknown site to build a new jail, according to a court-ordered update on the project. The report says commissioners should sign an agreement within the next few weeks. A federal judge ruled in September that conditions at the current jail are unconstitutional. Public comment for Indiana's invasive land species ban ended this week. Attendees at a public meeting were disappointed that the state didn't add two invasive trees to the list, the calorie pear and Norway maple. But a Department of Natural Resources representative says adding those two would delay a ban on other invasive species in Indiana. So that's why we need to go forward and adopt this one and then we can come back and reassess the rule and reassess new plant species and see how invasive they are in this environment. The Natural Resources Commission is expected to approve the ban on invasive land species at its meeting next month. The ban is expected to take effect in April and it will cover a variety of invasive species including Bell's honeysuckle and garlic mustard. The state says the spread of hepatitis A is slowing down, but it's still seeing new cases associated with the outbreak. More than 770 Hoosiers have been diagnosed with the highly contagious liver infection in the past year. Public and private health providers have administered nearly 100,000 vaccines since January. We still have some work to do in terms of continuing our investigation, making sure that we get vaccine out to as many at-risk individuals as possible. Pontonis says while several restaurant workers throughout the state have tested positive for the virus, it hasn't spread through food. Two people have died from hepatitis A in Indiana. Tenants of Bloomington's Players Pub have until the middle of next month to remove all of their belongings after a judge granted possession of the property to the landlord, Mary Hill. She says tenants Joe Esteville and Victoria Kilmer have been late paying rent twice and accused them of property damage. Hill says they are also behind on property taxes and utility payments. It's been nearly 10 months since Indiana legalized Sunday alcohol sales. Although liquor stores were largely against the change, some are reaping the benefits. Sundays are now one of the busiest days of the week for the beverage shop, a liquor store in Ellettsville. General Manager Adam Selinski says revenue is up 5 to 6 percent weekly since Sunday sales became legal. We've actually been waiting for it to slow down or maybe wear off. But it's not, I think. People have adjusted themselves now to have Sunday as a true weekend day. Before the law took effect, some brewers raised concerns about how it might impact their bottom line. Under the old state law, breweries had a monopoly on carry out Sunday sales. While some say they haven't noticed any change, Upland Brewing Company says it has been noticeable even in Sunday food and on-site beer sales. In an email, officials say the brewery is finding new ways to adapt to the law. The Graduate Hotel is nearly done, but the controversial new building is already making an impact on Bloomington's downtown. Many of those against the project were worried about how the size of the building would affect the area. We've toured individuals from many local com um, organizations and local businesses, including um, our neighbors. Uh, so we've had great feedback. Um, we're constantly communicating. 
The Bloomington Graduate Hotel is the 13th of its kind. Mobley says by 2020, they plan to open another 13 across the country. And Joe, you went through that hotel. So many details that are unique to Indiana. All Indiana based. And if you want a history lesson, you can tell they did their homework. Just go there, ask for a tour. It really is something. Awesome. Thanks, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Many farmers have been holding on to their crops, hoping for higher returns down the road. But an uptick in prices is not a guarantee. And we look at 2018 through the stories and events that shaped our coverage. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way. I knew it. It's just a blanket. It's laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. For most farmers, the harvest season is over. Many have to decide whether to try and sell their crop or hang on to it and hope prices go up. As Brock Turner reports, that decision is causing farmers a lot more stress this year than usual. Mike Brocksmith just finished harvesting all of his corn and soybeans. He raises about 1,500 acres in Knox County. About half of that is beans. And right now, they're just sitting while Brocksmith debates when to sell them. Across the country, soybean farmers are hurting. A record-setting crop paired with eroding opportunities to export in China have dropped prices about $2 per bushel. $2 a bushel is huge and basically took the profitability out of, out of soybeans this year, even if you had a good crop. And if you had a short crop, it could have really hurt. Price fluctuation is nothing new. Corn and soybean prices usually decrease right after harvest because the supply is so plentiful, but the market usually rebounds. A lot of farmers hang on to their crop while they wait for that to happen. But this year, that increase might not come. Wally Tyner is a professor at Purdue University. He spoke before a number of farmers last week at the Indiana Farm Equipment and Technology Expo in Indianapolis. He says projections of a strong harvest in South America paired with the current prices could push some farmers to sell. There's a lot of bushels, uh, at least we had to sell, and I'm sure many of you had the same sort of situation. Still, many farmers are holding out for better prices. Brock Smith stores most of his grain at his own farm. Others turn to grain elevators for storage while they watch the market. Kokomo Grain is one of the largest elevators in the country. It operates locations across the state, and this year, space is at a premium. There were some logistics challenges uh, in the industry. Uh, there was a large... Uh, larger than normal carry-in, in other words, beginning stocks in storage at elevators. So space was uh, a challenge in anticipation of large crops. Our company went to extraordinary means. Kokomo Grain and a number of farmers are doing everything in their power to store this year's crop. Barns that usually house equipment during winter months are now holding soybeans. And some are using ag bags, similar to large grocery bags, that store grain temporarily for a few months. And even before the chapter on 2018's harvest is complete, farmers will have to start planning now for 2019. Brock Smith says that's even more daunting of a task this year. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. For the past two weeks, volunteers around the state have been counting birds. The Christmas Bird Count is an annual event to collect data on birds around the globe. And as Rebecca Thiel reports, the count can tell us a lot about our climate. Jim Hengeveld co-leads the Christmas Bird Count at Lake Monroe. He says because birds tend to fly where they can find food and habitat, they're a good indicator of what's happening to the climate. Now, more than ever, uh, doing the monitoring of uh, populations at various times of years is, uh, is critical to 
keep a handle on what's going on. Take Indiana's state bird, the cardinal, for example. According to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, its range has moved north, where warmer temperatures have melted the snow, allowing it to find more food. That's obviously a very colorful species. It's the state bird of uh, six or seven states, and um, it's something that a lot of people know and are very happy to, to see. Hengeveld says northern bobwhites are becoming less common in the Bloomington area, and he's seeing more black vultures. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Rebecca Thiel. 2018 has been a year of tragedy and activism in Indiana, and our news team has been there to capture it all. This year, problems at the Department of Child Services erupted into the headlines. For the first time in a century, alcohol sales became legal on Sunday, and Hoosiers across the state took to the streets in protest to make their voices heard. prohibition of uh, Sunday sales in the state of Indiana is over. There's a lot of people like me that they're stuck. I can imagine having my children ripped out of my arms. It's not just their sad story of over the past few years, but it's this really awesome, optimistic view of what it can be. CBD oil won't cure me, nor does it eliminate all of my symptoms. However, it does minimize my symptoms during the day so that I can be in the moments I have left. I stand before you a condemned man, condemned without trial, condemned without notice. I think this is a message to other women that they can stand up for themselves too. The end of the school year at Noblesville West feels different this time around. But there are signs the Noblesville community is already starting to heal. We just really want to spark conversation and try to start a change somewhere. Because it begins with us. We're in the next generation, we're in the future. It is nerve wracking to think about that happening, but our number one priority is the safety of the students. It was a terrible situation, but he, he turned it into something that is uh, obviously better. I want to make it clear that uh, my actions on that day, uh, in my mind, were the only acceptable actions I could have done given the circumstances. This shouldn't happen now. That needs to go through the process. In a democratic society, the process is important. When you've got a team, a community, everybody working in the same um, direction and moving things forward, it's very reassuring. right thing and they can do that and will do that if given the opportunity and I know that all of you will do that
And we've been following the diary entries of a Civil War soldier from Indiana this year. Peter Matthews was a drummer in the 19th Indiana Regimental Band. Here's his entry on Christmas Day in 1861. Christmas Day. And what a change from a year ago. One at home spending a happy Christmas. Now in service of my country and Virginia's sacred soil, the land of secession. I feel like I would like to be at home and see how they spent the day. I confess, felt a little melancholy. The colonel asked us to take a drop of Christmas, which we gaily did. A nice supper was set for our special benefit, to which we done ample justice. Plenty of lager beer, of which we took a Christmas smack. Quite a pleasant Christmas, after all. You can read more of Matthew's diary entries at WTIUnews.org. And that's the end of this program. We won't be here next week, but our work will continue online as we cover the news at WTIUnews.org. Have a great holiday, and we'll see you in the new year. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu, and by WTIU members. Thank you.